Well, hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. And today is new car day, but not new car day where we now jump in my Audi TT, drive to a fancy swanky dealership and pick up a brand new car because the new car we're talking about today is this. My new to me 307,000 mile Volvo XC90. Well, yeah, you heard me right. This 2004 Volvo XC90 has 307,000 miles, almost 308,000 miles on the clock. And I recently bought this from Copart. Now, what in God's green earth, might you ask, has given me the desire to go and buy another auction car from Copart? Well, number one, I've always wanted an XC90, and I thought this one might be available for very cheap. So there's your first reason. But number two, that mileage. I mean, what a story that is. And obviously I was thinking that's an interesting project for YouTube. But how much money did I pay <laughs> to get my hands on this XC90? Well, you'll have to wait until a little bit later in the video, I'll reveal it then. But let's talk about what I have got for my money because it's quite a lot. So we have here a late 2004 Volvo XC90 D5, which is the 2.4 litre common rail diesel engine producing well, a little piddly 163 horsepower. But the thing that attracted me to this car most, and actually it's thanks to you guys, because this actually featured in the channel a couple of weeks ago when I was doing a car shopping on Copart video. And this was one of the cars in my watch list. And of course I've ended up buying it. But what lots of you said in the comments when I was looking at this car, and I didn't realize, is that it's the executive model the top of the line, sort of the Range Rover autobiography equivalent. And that comes with a ton of features that weren't standard on other models. Actually, just while we're outside the car, number one is these 18 inch BBS wheels. These were only available on the executive model and what the condition of them is not the best, but we'll look at that sort of thing in a bit more detail shortly. And also on the front, this is an exclusive design grill that was again, only available on the executive models. But inside the car is where I honestly get a little bit giddy because we have beautiful leather interior with piping. Again, an executive model only option. And chestnut or walnut, I forget, inlays. Now obviously not looking great there, but chestnut or walnut inlays looks absolutely fabulous. My most favorite thing of all though is these the green carpets oh my goodness aren't they incredible it makes me think of a sort of bentley continental gt from the same sort of era lots of them seem to be specified with green or blue carpets but they are also extremely plush and thick i should point out that the car did not arrive to me from copart looking like this in fact it was a very different story I'll roll some shots now of the condition it was in when it literally came off the trailer. But before I had the chance to film this reveal video, I've already had the amazing guys from Topaz over detailing it and doing a full interior clean, which is why it looks so, so incredible. So if you want to see what it looked like when it arrived, you'll have to subscribe to the channel now because the next video coming out on the channel will be that deep clean. It's a, a mental transformation, actually, probably the craziest one I've ever seen. So <laughs> the car did not look this good when it arrived. Now, there are some pretty major and various issues with this car, as you would expect it coming from an auction like Copart. But I'll tell you about them in a second. I just want to give you a quick message from today's video sponsor. Let me say a huge thank you to Carly for sponsoring today's video. And today I'm sat in my dad's BMW 1 Series convertible. Lovely day for it, I know. But I said, as he's had this car for quite a while now, I'd run a diagnostics check for him. So with this Carly scanner and the Carly app, you can plug into your car's OBD reader anywhere from your driveway, from a road trip if you go abroad, and access a bunch of hidden features, but critically, also run a diagnostics check on your car. It's extremely simple to connect. You just select your car. This is a BMW 1 Series, it's 2011. It's a E88 convertible and it's gasoline. And then we're gonna connect. The OBD reader is plugged in. And here we go, it will connect via Bluetooth very quickly. And we'll be presented with the ability to do a number of things, diagnostics, used car check, customization and coding and other. But we're gonna look at diagnostics today 
and read the codes. Now the brilliant thing about being able to do this with Carly is it saves you, well, time and money from having to go to a garage every time you want a fault light red, for example, on your dashboard. And they will charge you quite high prices as well just to plug your car in. So now we can go in and look at what the issues are. We have one for the central control unit, which is something to do with the heater and air conditioning, the iDrive, the instrument cluster, and the junction box passenger module. The only thing that comes up as a sort of mechanical problem really is with the DSC system. It looks like something to do with the steering angle sensor, but there's nothing too scary there. Now what's more, with this central control unit fault, we can go into the Carly Smart Mechanic and read some more instructions and information as to what it could be and also how to potentially repair it. This is extremely useful when being confronted with a fault code that you're not really familiar with. This gives you lots of information regarding it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna clear all these fault codes now and then in a few days time, I'd suggest to my dad to have them rechecked. One other fantastic feature of Carly, which I personally really like, is the live data feature. Now, in cars that I'm used to, like my Audi TT from 2004, there's only so much information the car gives you from standard. There's no fancy central infotainment screen where you can look at tire pressures and power. But with the live data feature on Carly, there's a plethora of systems that we can monitor as we drive along through our phone. For example, we can monitor our engine oil level, our engine speed in terms of the RPMs, how many kilometers the car has done on this current oil. We even have a sensor for our foot control, which shows us how much as a percentage we're depressing the throttle pedal. And more critically, we can monitor temperatures like the intake air temperature, the coolant temperature, the oil temperature, and many more things. So by having Carly, then I'd say that you just end up having a much better idea of your car's overall health, and you have the permanent ability to be able to read codes and diagnose any issues. So if you don't have Carly already, I encourage you strongly to go to the link in description and check it out for yourself. And you can use my code on screen now to get yourself a nice little discount too. Thanks so much to Carly for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to the Volvo XC90. So let's start outside then, and no better place than the driver's side of the car, because we have some pretty impressive scratches that go all along here, and this is very dented there. And we've got a huge scuff down here as well. Also, well, it looks quite good right now, but this driver's lock thing is, yeah, completely come away. There you go. You can actually shimmy it back in like that, and I might just try and glue it on. But cosmetically, on this side, it's, it's pretty bad. It doesn't stop there either, because the wheels, all four wheels, huh, that's the name of my podcast. You should check it out, guys. <laughs> all four wheels are, um, really really bad condition and actually like i say topaz have already been to detail this car and without spending hours and hours on them they couldn't really get any of this really bedded in stuff off the car obviously that mud is just from literally driving in here so yeah the wheels are in pretty awful state also there's some tape on this wing mirror here presumably keeping something together but obviously that didn't come from the factory quite like that but even worse, <laughs> even worse is this side, which is missing sort of half the wing mirror. Even it's snapped here at the join. And on the front, the glass is completely cracked and I've actually taped it in place as a very, very temporary fix. So please don't shout at me. Uh, I've actually tried to order a new one already, but this was even worse when it arrived. So again, check out the next video to see what I mean. Around the back of the car, well, dare I say it, it's in pretty good condition. There's nothing really to talk about here in terms of damage. The only thing is number plate could probably do with replacing it. Normally these plastic bumpers get really faded and, and once that happens, you can't really bring them back. But yeah, they, they just look brilliant actually. Now you'll notice the headlights. Now I think these came with Xenons and that might be part of it being an executive edition car. You can't really see them or benefit from that because these, headlights are very very foggy and i did say to the guys at topaz that i might try and do a machine polish on these because i did that with the tt and they came out really well actually paintwork in general and i must just say the color of this car i don't know how well this camera picks it up but when the sun is shining on it there's a really deep sort of purple hue if any of you watch shmi here's mclaren which is it the 675 lt has that sort of deep purple on it I think it's Orion purple. 
this reminds me of that. I know it's pushing it to compare this car to a McLaren in any way, shape or form, but the fleck that comes out of this deep blue paintwork is uh, genuinely gorgeous. The paintwork in general, you know, not all, obviously, there's scratches everywhere you look. There's a little bit of rust there from where it's been chipped. But all in all, again, apart from the damages on the side and the huge scratch along here, yeah, it's, it's not awful. I guess the more I say that, the more I realise it is actually terrible. But when you're here, when I pay for this car, you're not really going to mind. We have on the XC90, of course, a bit like Range Rover, if it decides to work, let's find the key. Central locking works on this one, which is remarkable. There we go. Split folding tailgate. And sorry, I'm absolutely obsessed with these green carpets. I just can't, cannot believe how amazing they are. Split folding tailgate, like I say, here we have a lever lever to pull up that rear one, which I really like actually. It feels like such a tactile design and in pretty good condition as well. Normally on the old Range Rovers, these struts would go after this amount of time, but all in great condition here. Of course, this being an XC90 as well, it is a seven seater. Now I've got it in five seat configuration mode, but we'll have a look at the seven seats later in this video. There's plenty more impressive features to show you inside the car, this being an executive model as well. Uh, but first, I just wanna jump in and tell you how much I paid for this, because I know you're eagerly waiting to know. Now quickly, before I say it, if you've not already, comment below with your guess. Don't delete it once you hear it. I genuinely wanna hear what you think I bid for, well, what do you think I paid for this car in total? Right, have you commented below what you think I paid? So, the total amount I paid for this car was £847. £847 for a 2004 executive Volvo XC90. Okay, it's got 307,000 miles on it, but that's nothing for these engines, right? That's what I hear all the time from Volvo owners. And actually, if you go anywhere online where cars are advertised and you search for Volvos, lots and lots of them are around the quarter million mile mark. So it's not that scary. But £847, I think it's a lot of car for the money. In fact, there's this website called Redcorn and you can put your car in a bit like we buy any car and it will tell you how much they'll pay you for scrap for the car. And this came out as 525 quid. So to be honest, there was really nothing, barely anything to lose on buying this car. The only thing I've had to really fork out for is tax and insurance. It cost me £67 so far to tax it for two months as I had to pay for the whole of July and August. And the insurance on this car is quite expensive as well, £700 a year for me. But anyway, apart from that, I'm gonna pay for that on any car, really nothing to lose. So what did come with this car then? Because when that TT turned up, if you don't know what I'm referencing, the last car and the first car I bought from Copart was an Audi TT. That came with a folder full, bulging at the seams, of paperwork, receipts, history, you name it, it had it. It also had two keys, whereas here, I've just got the one and it's not very enthusiastic, this key, it's a little bit sad. Uh, but yeah, what did this car come with in terms of history? Well, also, not a lot. Now, according to Copart, this car has one owner from new, see now not including me, and well, the service history corroborates that a little bit. Basically, this car was sourced at Squire Furnock's dealer in Slough, and it was continuously serviced there and at their sister dealership in High Wycombe for a number of years. And I'm really struggling to find the correct booklet here. So it had its PDI at 60 miles on the 14th of October, 2004. So very late uh, 2004. And then it was serviced again in 2005 at 17 and a half thousand miles. Serviced again later in 2005, just six months later at 40,000 miles. It was then serviced just a year later again at 72,000 miles. Then at 107,000 miles in July of 2007 where the timing belt was replaced. Had another service in 2007 at 125,000 miles, 153,000 miles six months later, 176,000 miles another six months later, 200,000 miles in July of 2009, 220,000 miles in January of 2010, and the last service that I have on file was at 233,000 miles in August of 2011. 
And these were all done at Squire Furnux dealer in Slough, but then High Wycombe for the last sort of five or six years there. So uh, they've always been done in this same place, which does sort of corroborate the story of it being one owner from new. Now I can't confirm that because I don't actually have the V5 and a little bit of annoyance, I have to say with Copart is all they supply me with for this car it was a V5 reference number. So bought the car, won it, paid for it, all of that stuff, arranged delivery, and they supply with a V5 reference number, which means you can go onto the DVLA website, claim that you've sold the car to yourself, essentially, and then you get a V5 sent that way. But the number they sent me didn't work. And this was a Friday evening, I realised this, just after the car had arrived. So I couldn't go to the post office to tax or, well, yeah, tax it or do a V62 for a new V5. So over the whole weekend, essentially, I was unable to drive the car because I couldn't tax it. This V5 reference number they gave me was wrong. So I don't quite know what's happened there. And they also couldn't do anything about it. They basically were unable to help me. So I'm a little bit confused as to what's happened there. Maybe there has been another owner somewhere down the line and the V5 number they've been supplied with was incorrect. Anyway, it was a little bit of a pain uh, and very annoying from Copart's side because it's not how the car was advertised, was it? So anyway, now I have been able to tax and insure it and drive it a little bit around. I've been able to come and film this video for you guys, but service history, it was obviously driven a lot. I mean, can I just reiterate? It was on 233,000 miles in August of 2011. And this car was left the factory or left the showroom in October of 2004. So not even seven years, gosh, not even seven years. It did 233,000 miles. What's the maths on that? That's got to be around 35,000 miles a year, hasn't it? Which is quite a lot, maybe 40, 35. Let's stick with that. So it did a lot of miles, presumably by a, a businessman that did a lot of traveling up and down the motorways. But yeah, the service history stops at 2011 and I don't have anything else. Uh, no other paperwork at all came with the car, just the one key. And I mean, it is the original book folder here, but that was it. But needless to say, 847 pounds and it does run and drive from what I can ascertain. Hilariously though, the amount that I technically won this car for, as in what I bid for it, was 300 quid. That's what I bid for the car. No one else bid higher, so I just took it at that. The seller then counted with an offer of £1,500. So that's what his reserve was, essentially. I then counted with 400 He then counted with 500 And I, I paid 500 quid for it. But unfortunately, with Copart, there was about 250 quid of fees on top of that. And then £100 or so for delivery, bringing it to 847 But essentially, I, I won this car for for 500 quid, at least that's what the seller was, was paid for it, which is just absolutely remarkable. I mean, that's less than the scrap value. And as we'll get into in a second, the amount of real estate in here and the amount of toys, I mean, it's very least worth just keeping as a storage unit on your driveway. <laughs> okay, so you join me in the back of the XC90 and I have to admit, I am jolly impressed with the functionality, versatility, and also, build quality of this XC90 in general. Now there aren't that many toys in this particular one, although it's the executive model, there were two main things that could be optioned with. One was a fridge, which this one does have, I'll show you when we jump in the front. And the other one was rear seat entertainment, like you do get on a lot of the L322 Range Rovers. Now this one doesn't have that, but to be honest, for me, I'm quite happy about that because back in 2004, that would have been the next sliced bread. Like it would have been the coolest thing. I know for one, if I was what seven years old in 2004, I would have thought that was the coolest thing, having a TV in the car. But in 2023, it would look very dated and antiquated. And so right now I'm glad it wasn't optioned with that. We have this gorgeous leather piped as well in the back too. And it's in really remarkable condition. I mean, as it seems that main owner of the car was someone who went up and down the motorway a lot and you can assume that that was commuting and therefore probably didn't have passengers so all of the other seats I mean even the driver's seat but the rear seats are in incredible condition so this is a seven seater then let's try and uh, show you how cool it is so uh, yeah these seats actually I should just mention before we do this you can as a rear passenger adjust yourself so you can come forward 
so that the seven seat passengers have extra leg room. But even in this forward most position, which I'm in now, and my driving position ahead, my knees are, are touching the seat, but it's perfectly comfortable. But you can also then go further back and the leg room is genuinely very impressive actually. But we do now want to use the seven seat. So let's see if I can do it with the doors closed just for the camera. So bring this one forwards, obviously. We need to do that with all of them. This is gonna be quite difficult, isn't it? Hang on a second. Let's have a look at the car in its seven seat configuration then. So split tailgate down. I'm just gonna move everything that's on this further part of the car onto this part here. Now you'll notice actually, I should just say, air tire compressor for, for the tires and jump leads. Now when this car arrived, it need, needed jump starting and the front right was completely flat. So my initial impression was, oh, for God's sake, I've, you know, I've bought something that's gonna be undrivable here. But overnight on the trickle charger, it went straight back up to 12.6 volts overnight. And I pumped up the tire with 35 PSI, or whatever it's meant to be, and it's not lost any. So uh, maybe a very tiny bit. I think I did it again and it was at 33 after about three days. So that's why these are in here, because I don't completely trust the battery on this car. In fact, I'm a little bit concerned that uh, I'm gonna get stuck in this lay-by. But anyway, that's why <laughs> these bits are, are in the back. So the first thing I think I'm gonna to need to do actually is remove this partition here. That's nice and easy to do actually. So let's take this out of the car. People are gonna think I'm fly tipping actually, aren't they? Probably not the cleverest place to do this. Uh, let's get this out. So now let's recline the second row of seats. This carpet needs to go, but what we can do now is push up this rear seat here, like so. And then all you have to do is pull out the under seat here. And that's it, you've got seven seats. Fantastic. Let's just show you on this side so you can see it a bit better. Seat forward, and all you've got to do, push the rear seat up and pull out the base. And that is it. It's so, so easy and genuinely, you know, spacious back here as I'm about to demonstrate you. Headrest go up like so, happy days. And then if we pull these seats back, I'll give you a demonstration of how much room we actually have here in the car. So let's pull that one back there. And as you can see, this one can go forward too. Let's just do that for now. So this is realistically where the seat would be. Still got a bit of knee room, still got a bit of head room as well. I mean, you could, you could spend some time in here. And in the seventh, seventh row, the third row, we even have a compartment, which is pretty generous, although it doesn't stay up. You could put a lot of stuff in there and two cup holders on each side. The other thing that this has, and I don't know if this is because it's executive or not, is we've got these controls here. Now underneath, you can actually plug in two separate headphones, which means I don't know, your brother or your sister here, and you in the back here could listen to different things. So dad could be driving along listening to The Archers on Radio 4, but you want to listen to the new Busted album. So you plug in your headphones, you select the source the CD, and here you go. You can change the volume and skip the tracks. Very, very cool. I would have loved that as a kid. But yeah, a very much usable third row of seats here. And I, I just... <laughs> It's huge in here. It feels like it's bigger than my house. I mean, look how far it is to the front of the car. It's, it's gargantuan. This is probably a good place to mention the headlining. It's, it's seen better days. And uh, yeah, it, it could definitely do with being retrimmed and, and sorted, but at least where I'm sat here, it doesn't really, well, it's not sagging at all. So it's not a problem. Uh, but yeah, certainly for the second row passengers, if you're sat here, your head would probably be up here somewhere. So that's a little bit annoying, but again, come on. I mean, 800 pounds. The boot space as well, when the third row is up, is also not bad. You can see a camera there, rucksack. Still get plenty of things in there, even with the seven seats. So what toys do we have in the front then? Uh, quickly, before we look at any of those, I'm just gonna hopefully start the car as to not drain the battery when I'm showing you the toys. Here we go, moment of truth. Yes, 
That's very good. That saved me a call to the AA this afternoon. So it is lovely in the front here. Again, everything you touch is, is gorgeous. This feels so nice under the thumb there. Steering wheel is really minimalistic, but lovely to hold. I mean, it does help that, again, Topaz have really improved this car. Don't, don't forget to check out the next video. You can see what a state it was in when it did arrive. I love the minimalistic, simplistic dials as well. Very, very cool, very Swedish, isn't it? Of course it is, but I do really enjoy that. There's the all-important odometer, 307,693 miles. You see, it really is what I say. You will notice there's an ABS light we've got there. Now, that seems to go off as soon as I start driving and then come on about 30 seconds later. So don't really know what that is, but needless to say, this thing is going to need an inspection and, and a service. Seats in the front are all electronic and have the memory function, which is nice. Also has the comfort entry, so the seat moves back when you exit the car and moves back into your position once you sit down in it. Got electric windows, and uh, like I say, we have a fridge, which has two settings on it, light and strong. You can put bottles of water, etc., in there. It keeps them nice and cool. We do also have, and I found out this by knocking it accidentally, this here, which is <laughs> a mobile phone. I don't think I've ever had, I mean my 7 Series had one in the dash there, but I've never had a physical one on a cord like this that you would put to your ear. Absolutely fantastic. And to go with the phone in here, we even have a SIM card. Oh my God, I've just dropped it. Well, we did have a SIM card in this slot and it was from Asda Mobile, which also just dates the car, doesn't it? Now behind the gear selector, we have a few other things. I'm not sure what that is. I think that's for home link or, or something like that. Parking sensors, I'm not sure if they're front or rear or just rear, I haven't actually checked. And we have power fold mirrors. Even though that one over there is a bit buggered, uh, it does still work, as does the driver's side. So that's nice. And DSTC is Volvo's sort of stability control system. Now it's on as standard always, but this is the button so that you can turn it off. I can't see if I've just done that now, but I don't think we're gonna be breaking any necks with the speeds I'm driving in this car, so we can not worry about that. Have heated seats both sides as well, heated front and rear windscreen, all the usual stuff. And here's how you'll dial a, a number there. As it's the executive edition, the front seats apparently have an extra soft leather in them. And I mean, although the rear seats are very comfortable, these definitely do feel a little bit spongier. So I don't know how much truth there is to that, but they do feel a little bit better, I suppose. And they are very comfortable. We also have this here, which is in leather, which wouldn't normally be, which is a very nice place to rest your elbow as you drive along. There is a pretty fundamental issue with this car though, and it's to do with the sort of infotainment system. A few of you might have noticed already, there's been a few clues, but essentially, and I've done lots of research and taking things out and inspecting them before I had the chance to film this video, there's, a, there's an issue with this fibre optic system that runs all of the infotainment stuff in this car. It's these fibre optics that go all around, they go the instrument cluster on the dash, the satellite navigation, the radio, the uh, satellite navigation disc under the passenger seat. There's also an antenna at the back in the, in the roof lining, sort of above that seventh uh, seat, uh, which is connected. And it's all connected by these two orange fiber optics cables. And basically when there's a break in the system anywhere, it, it disables everything on that system. So I have no access to my sort of combi display on, on the dash. The bit will show you where the doors open or a warning that comes up or your miles per gallon even. That is completely off and I cannot get it on. Also the pop-up satellite navigation screen, which this car has, it doesn't work. I cannot get it to come up at all. The radio doesn't work, won't switch on. And yeah, essentially everything on that system uh, I can't use, like the phone as well, for example. So it's a little bit uh, annoying because I can't listen to music or the radio or use the sat nav or any of these fun features that the car has. I cannot use. All I've done so far is had a look under the passenger seat at the fiber optics that plug into the satellite navigation disc tray. Uh, I have actually had the central console out looking at the back of the radio to see if I can spot any obvious tears or breakages in the fiber optic cable, but nothing I can really see. So any advice, uh, if you know about this, welcomed below. Otherwise, the value of the car 
I might just might just leave it. But it's a little bit of a shame because I'd love to show you the the pop-up sat nav and and see what the sound system is like in this car and use the phone and do lots of quirky stuff. But unfortunately, we we can't while it's not working. But I think that's pretty much it in terms of the features of my <laughs> 800 pound XC90 Executive. I am very happy with my purchase. I think it's absolutely fantastic. It's incredibly luxurious in here and it would have been a car that cost almost 10 times what I paid for it. Sorry, 100 times what I paid for it less than 20 years ago, especially when you adjust for inflation. I also love these sort of grab handles they have on, on both sides here. It makes you feel like you can go anywhere in the car. So let me know what you think about my 307,000 mile Volvo XC90. Do you like the green carpets? Do you think it was a good purchase? What do you think I should do with it next? Thank you so much for watching this video. It is with your support and with support from sponsors like Carly that I'm able to take these risks essentially and, and buy these pretty silly, outrageous cars. But I'm all the more happier for it because I think it's tremendously interesting. And if we can maybe keep this thing on the road, give it a new lease of life when otherwise it would probably just go to scrap, and that would make me very, very happy indeed. So any suggestions, as always, are very welcomed. If you haven't liked the video already, please do give it a thumbs up if you did enjoy it because that'll help YouTube to show it to more people, which means I can buy more cars like this in the future. And also do subscribe if you're interested in seeing the cleaning process of this car. I've not shown you too much of the actual interior and bits and bobs today because I want you to go ahead and watch the next video that will be coming out where we see the just amazing transformation that the Topaz guys did on this thing. It was completely disgusting in here, absolutely horrendous. And they just completely made it new again. I, I cannot quite believe it. So yeah, do stay tuned for that and make sure you subscribe so that you do not miss out on it when it lands. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you very, very soon.